Turn to Joshua chapter 2. Let's go. And as you turn, i give you a quick recap. Joshua chapter 2. So where you're at, in case you missed last week or you, you need a recap of where we're at today, here's where we're at today. Um, we've concluded the 40-year complaining, whining, grumbling journey through the wilderness. They complain. Say this with me. Complain and remain. Praise and be raised. Amen. So they decided to complain and they remained. Um, in fact, over 600,000 of them remained and didn't make it into the promised land. Um, if you complain, you'll probably see a delay. Uh, but Israel was learning along the journey that they had been delivered from to be delivered to. It was beautiful that they had been delivered from Egypt, but they needed to know we've been delivered to a deeper relationship with our God. They knew that they had been brought out of, but it was not just that they had been brought out of, but though they could be brought into. So they had been brought out of bondage, out of slavery, so God could bring them into the promised land. But even in that, some decided to settle. Some decided that the promised land was not where they were going to make uh, their final destination. And they settled uh, east of the Jordan. They settled outside of God's best for their lives. And the worst part of all was they still were going to have to go into the promised land, help them defeat it, see all the miracles, see all the signs and wonders that God did, walk the land, see what God's best looked like, and still make the decision to settle outside of that. My Lord. But they were understanding what the law could lead them to, it couldn't bring them into. Moses, the lawgiver, could lead them to peer in to the promise, but it was only Joshua, who was an Old Testament type of Christ, whose name means the Lord saves, or salvation of the Lord, that would bring them from the, the edge of promise to actually leading into. Just like the law in this day and age leads us to peer out of a place of knowing our depreciation, knowing what we don't have so that then we can step into what Jesus has for us. Amen. Um, and that brings us to chapter 2. But I want you to know something about chapter 2 that really resonates in my heart. Chapter 2 in its entirety takes place during a pause. Chapter 2 and everything that we're going to see happen is during the three-day delay where God wasn't supposed to be doing anything. Do you remember in chapter 1 where Joshua goes and he tells the people, he walks through the camp, he says, get everything ready because in three days we're going over the Jordan. But that three-day period was supposed to be a pause. They're supposed to be doing nothing. Nothing's supposed to be going on. And you ought to make note of this. A pause with God is not his passivity. A pause with God is not his passivity. I mean, we sing these lyrics practically every month. Even though I can't see it, you're working. Even though I can't feel it, you never stop. You never stop. We sing it practically every month that even when I can't see it, God, you're up to something. Even when I don't have the Holy Ghost goosebumps, God, I know you're up to something. That it might seem like it's a pause with God, but I think even Ava talked about this. There are times when the Lord says to just be still, be in a pause, and let me do something because I can do more in your being still than in your doing something. It's like Mary and Martha, you got one running around all crazy, the other one just sat at the feet of Jesus. He said, you chose the thing that can't be taken away. You learned how to be still before me. And in that pause, in that seemingly nothing's supposed to happen, God was saving a woman's soul named Rahab. Not only that, but God was setting up the lineage and establishing further the lineage that would lead us to our Messiah our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And even more so, God was establishing a word of encouragement that, hear me, would not have come otherwise. It would have never come had they not had this pause. God was going to come in the most unusual, unlikely person was going to deliver a word of encouragement that would come back to the people of Israel. 
And so I want to encourage you, if you feel like there's something delayed in your life today, if you feel like there's been a pause in the movement of God, you feel like you've been praying for something, you've been pre- you're, you don't feel, you know, I've been praying for something, and it doesn't seem like anything's happening, that there is something happening, that the hand of God is not denied from your situation just because there appears to be a delay in the time you prayed and the activity of God in that prayer, so it seems to you. And I want to tell you something else. God dropped this in my heart in prayer that some of you, maybe even the situation looks like it has died. You have prayed so long and it has been such an elapse of time and it seems like it has only either gotten worse or the situation is literally, it just seems like it could never, ever, ever come to be. It's a dead situation. I have good news. I serve a God of the resurrection today. My God specializes in bringing dead things to life. Hallelujah. Man, you look at Jairus' daughter. We're not even in chapter 2. Help me, Jesus. <laughs> Jairus' daughter. Jesus. is on. He, he comes urgently. My daughter's sick. My daughter's sick. I need you to come heal her. He's on his way. And what happens? He gets delayed along the way. Remember? He gets delayed by this woman that for 12 years she's had an issue of blood. She's unclean. She can't go around anybody. And here she comes busting through the crowd to stop Jesus who's on a mission. Jesus was on a mission and here comes an interruption. I'll be an interruption to him anytime. Thank you, Lord. And as he's interrupted by this woman who's unclean, this woman with the issue of blood, meanwhile, a servant comes during the delay and says, your daughter's dead. Don't even bother him anymore. No matter. Jesus heals the woman. Jesus goes and raises the daughter. Amen. So if he seems delayed on the way, don't get discouraged. We got to go. Man, thank you, Jesus. All right, let's look at... I need a drink of water. (laughs) Chapter 2. And Joshua, the son of Nun, sent two men secretly from Shittim as spies, saying, Go view the land, especially Jericho. And they went and came into the house of a prostitute, whose name was Rahab, and lodged there. And it was told to the king of Jericho, Behold, men of Israel have come here tonight to search out the land. Then the king of Jericho sent to Rahab, saying, Bring out the men who have come to you, who entered your house, for they have come to search out all the land. But the woman had taken the two men and hidden them. And she said, True, the men came to me, but I don't know where they came from. And when the gate was closed and about to be closed at dark, the men went out. I don't know where the men went. Pursue them quickly, for you will overtake them. But she had brought them up to the roof and hid them with the stalks of flax that she had laid in order on the roof. So the men pursued after them on the way to the Jordan as far as the fords, and the gate was shut as soon as the pursuers had gone out. Before the men lay down, she came up to them on the roof and said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land, and that the fear of you has fallen upon us, and that the inhabitants, all the inhabitants of the land, melt away before you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt. And what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan and Sihon and Og, whom you delivered to destruction. And as soon as we heard it, our hearts melted and there was no spirit left in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. Now then, please swear to me by the Lord that as I have dealt kindly with you, you also will deal kindly with my father's house and give me a sure sign that you will save alive my father, my mother, my brothers, my sisters, and all who belong to them and deliver our lives from death. And the men said to her, our life for yours, even to death. If you do not tell this business of ours, then when the Lord gives us the land, we will deal kindly and faithfully with you. Then she let them down by a rope through the window, for her house was built into the city wall, so that she lived in the wall. And she said to them, go into the hills, or the pursuers will encounter you, and hide there three days until the pursuers have returned. Then afterward you may go your way. The men said to her, we will be guiltless with respect to this oath of yours that you have made us swear. Behold, when we come into the land, you shall tie this scarlet cord in the window 
through which you let us down. And you shall gather into your house your father and mother, your brothers, and all your father's household. Then if anyone goes out of the doors of your house into the street, his blood will be on his own head, and we will be guiltless. But if a hand is laid on anyone who is with you in the house, his blood will be on our head. But if you tell this business of ours, then we will be guiltless with respect to your oath that you have made us swear. And she said, according to your words, so let it be. Then she sent them away, and they departed, and she tied the scarlet cord in the window. They departed and went into the hills and remained there three days until the pursuers returned, and the pursuers searched all along the way and found nothing. Then the two men returned. They came down from the hills and passed over and came to Joshua, the son of Nun, and they told him all that had happened. And they said to Joshua, truly, the Lord has given all the land into our hands, and also all the inhabitants of the land melt away because of us. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this word in season. I thank you for the word of encouragement that comes from Joshua chapter 2. Your timeless, limitless, perfect word, God. I thank you for it. And I pray now open hearts and minds to receive. Remove every wall of distraction, any bit of demonic opposition from the mind and heart that would keep them from receiving this word today. In Jesus' name. And everyone said... Amen. All right, let's dive in. I hope you got your notepad and your pencil. All right, I'll take that as a yes. <laughs> Silence and stares. So we begin in verse 1. Joshua, he meets with two spies, and it says he met with them secretly. Now, I believe that there's two kinds of wisdom. There's the wisdom that learns from your failures and your mistakes. And then there's the kind of wisdom that learns from other people's failures or mistakes. And I believe this is the latter with Joshua because I believe he learned from someone else's mistakes and those mistakes were made by Moses. And I'm going to tell you what I mean. Moses chose 12 spies. Moses did it openly. Moses talked before everybody about the 12 spies and he sent them out and they came back. 10 out of the 12 had a negative report. It turned into a big disaster. It was a detonation. And Joshua, I believe, out of that experience said, hold on, wait a minute. We're at the precipice of entering the promised land. I ain't doing that. I'm going to take two people that I know I can really trust. A lot of scholars believe one out of the two tribes was Caleb, though I can't prove it. But it's nice to think that he would have definitely picked Caleb because Caleb would have been like, let's do it. And if anybody came with him, wanted to talk trash or be negative, he'd have wrapped him upside the head and said, get your mind right. We're taking this land. And so he meets with the two spies and he meets with them secretly. He doesn't tell anybody. He's got these two that he trusts. And he says, listen, I want you to go into the promised land. I want you to, to go spy it out. But he says this phrase, if you look in verse 1, he says, especially Jericho. Especially Jericho. I want you to see what we're going to get, but I need you to hone in on a place called Jericho, which was several miles from where they were camped. But when you read about Jericho and anything that you read historically about that place, you realize why fear and apprehension could have no place in the plans of God. I mean, scholarly speaking, it was seen as the first fortified city that ever existed. Uh, I mean, and not only that, but they've had thousands of years since they first fortified it to establish that fortification. So you can imagine this was not just some thrown together city, it was heavily fortified, it had extremely high and wide walls. It was viewed in the ancient world as impenetrable. And now what? You got this ragamatag group of gypsies that have been wandering through the wilderness and are what, just going to waltz in and take down this thousands and thousands of year old fortified city? It's absurd. I didn't even know when I was praying about it and thinking about it and writing my notes, I said, I don't even know what to compare that to. Hey, you got this group of gypsies wandering around. Now they're going to come over and just take down the most fortified city in the entire promised land. But that was the faith that Joshua had. He said, let's go for the big one first. If God be for us, come on. 
Jo- Joshua's like, Let- let's go for the giant first. And I love what Corey said, man. I, oh, Holy Spirit's bearing witness. Hallelujah. Because I've got a bird's eye view. I know from the point Joshua says, spy out Jericho first. We're taking down the giant first. We're going for the big one first. I've got a bird's eye view that I know things are going to happen between the moment he tells them that and his faith to take down the giant first, the big dog first, that there's going to be some tremendous things that happen that are going to boost his faith in the meantime. They're going to walk across the Jordan on dry ground. The the leader, the commander of the army of the Lord is going to meet with Joshua right before they encircle the city. And he says, hey, you for us or against us? And we know it's Jesus in bodily form. Back in that time, it's a, a form of Jesus in the Old Testament. He says, I'm here to take over. We know a bird's eye view of that, but Joshua chose to have a divine perspective by faith and say, that city's ours. I don't know what you need to get divine perspective on, but if I've ever had a confirmation in a service, it's been one today. you got to stop looking at your carnal eyes and your carnal brain and start seeing with God's eyes and God's mind at a situation. He didn't know what was going to happen. You don't know what's going to happen between now and when God does what he's going to do. There may be all these little things that happen along the way where your faith just keeps getting built up and built up. And you're like, I do have divine perspective. I am walking by faith and not by sight. Hallelujah. Taking down the big dog first. And then... As we continue to read, can you just imagine with me? You got your two spies, right? These are your two most trusted individuals in all the land. Two most trusted people, your warriors. They've got the heart of gold. They're solid. They're rock solid. I'm going to send you out. I need you to spy the land. Check out Jericho. This is a big deal. Jericho's fortified, men. All right, here's what it's looking like there. It's going to be, you know, probably pretty intense. I need you to go there. I need you to get me some intel. I need you to come back. You're on a mission. You're on a mission from the Lord God Almighty. And then we read, and they came into the house of a prostitute. (laughs) Doth my eyes deceive me? Are you here for business or pleasure? Uh, This is a textual problem. (laughs) Like the first spot, like we're on a mission, where should we head? Here there's a girl named Rahab. She's got some real, real nice accommodations. And you know the worst part is, some people, it started with Josephus, and they kind of, some people took their cues from him. They want to dumb down like what she did as an occupation. Like, oh no, she was a clerk like at the Motel 6. No, she was not. She was a prostitute by trade. In fact, she's mentioned three times in the New Testament. And guess what? Two out of the three times she's mentioned in the New Testament, she's referred to as Rahab, the prostitute, or the harlot. Make no mistake of what she did for work. And by the way, side note, I did ask my son if I could share this with you. I share my sermon information with my son. There's only so much you can say repeatedly before a 12-year-old's curiosity catches up to him. (laughs) Daddy, what's a prostitute? Now, best part is Aaron's downstairs, like, getting something from the laundry room, and I was like, "Ah, (laughs) that's a tricky one. (laughs) Then I like to call, I got kicked into, uh, you know, we got, like, PG, PG PG-13. I got kicked into HG. Holy Ghost rating. It was in that moment where I was like, gee, ha, let's see. In my mind, I'm like, dear Jesus, even when I can't feel it, you're working. <laughs> you never stop. And so I was able to tastefully and gracefully explain to him what that meant and at the same time give the redemptive plan behind what God was doing in that moment. So parents, if you ever need the HG version, just pray very, very strongly and hem and haw for about 30 to 40 seconds. (laughs) But I want to tell you something. Don't get all judgy on me. There was a strategic plan in them going there. So we're like, pastor's gone new age. Oh, boy. He's supporting them going to a brothel. (laughs) 
Don't judge me just yet. I can give you three reasons why this was a strategic move and that they were not there indeed for her occupational abilities. Now, reason number one, she lived in the wall. It was located in the wall. Think about it. If I'm going into a place, I'm going to spy it out, and it could get volatile, I'm probably not going to go into the heart of the city, right? If I'm going to spy out South Pro or Providence, I'm probably not going to go down to like South Providence or something at midnight. I'm going to find a place where I can get a good view of the city and yet still remain able to get out of there. She lived in the wall, so they could get a view, they could get a vantage point, and if things go south, they go. Reason number one. Reason number two was a high traffic area. So they had foreigners coming in as well as locals. It's trying to be inconspicuous, man. You got two of these guys coming in from out of town. Where do they go? A place where they can remain inconspicuous. And finally, we know from the text, it had a window. Had a window. It was a room with a view. It was a city view where they could spy out the land from the window. And they could get a vantage point of everything that was going on that they could bring back. Now, just remember, New Testament says to avoid the appearance of evil. Amen. They didn't have that in the old. <laughs> avoid the appearance of evil. Amen. Amen? Yeah. All right. Let's make sure we both know that scripture. <laughs> Nevertheless, hide as they tried, it comes back to the king that they're there. They, they tried to do this inconspicuous move. But it gets back to the king, as we see, it was told to the king that there are men of Israel there. And, and the king, he's alarmed by this. He's alarmed that there's these, there's these guys from Israel. And, and he's so alarmed that he's got to send in the CIA. He sends in his central intelligence agency to find out, like, who are these guys and what are they doing in my city? Why are these Israelites here? Because... This was of all the news the king could have received that day and everything that could have been told to him, this was the worst news he ever could have received. There are two people here that are children of God. That There are two people here who call Yahweh the Lord God of heaven and earth their God. Oh, we're going somewhere now. I, want, I feel like I heard this earlier in the service. Now, I, I want you to know, if you want to see this to confirm it after the service, feel free. I have this written in a square. Note this. And then I have this written beside that. The enemy is threatened by you. The enemy is threatened by you. It's not the other way around. I, there's somebody here that needs to operate in a level of spiritual authority that you're not operating in clearly because God has said it once. Now God said it twice. How many times does God need to say it in a service without two people? We didn't have a powwow where I said, hey, check out my sermon notes, Christian. That's called the Holy Spirit, folks. And the Holy Spirit's here and alive to tell somebody that the enemy is threatened by you. The king knew the Israelites travel like the rest, but they don't travel alone. They travel with somebody named God Almighty. And I had a meeting with my brother John Nagel this past week. We were talking about it, and we're talking about, you know, when you come out of darkness and you understand the light, when you come out of something and you understand the power of God, but you also realize, yes, there is a wickedness. Yes, there is an evil. Yes, there is an enemy. Yes, there is somebody against your soul. But when you come out of that and you experience the power of God, you know, oh, he's no match for God. <laughs> Hallelujah. I've been in lots of, lots of instances where somebody had something dark inside of them that had to come out, and guess what? When Jesus shows up, it flees. That's why when somebody's got something going on in their house, we come by, we open up a window, and we start anointing doors, and we say, you got to get out in Jesus' name. Listen, there is an authority that Christ wants you to understand that you have in your home. You've got it in your personal life. You've got it in your... I even believe animals understand the authority of Christ inside of you. You might, you might think I sound silly, but I, you remember when we used to walk dogs, those were our dates, right? We had 
you know, we, 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 we had two nickels rubbed together. I couldn't take her out on a proper date, so I took her dog walking. So we go to the RISPCA, and we walked so many dogs that we got to, like, the upper tier where you could walk, like, the really mean ones. Literally, I'm not kidding, like the ones that nobody else could, could walk, like the ones that like their pupils were dilated, all they did was growl at you. You're like, c- c- come on, Cujo. Like, it's going to be, you had not been bit by anything, have you? <laughs> and I remember this one time, you probably remember this, there was this dog, and it was like barking at me and growling at me. It was at the edge of like the, the gate where it was supposed to come out. And it, and like, I don't know, maybe it was a little bit of pride. You know, I got a fucking dog going to show me up in front of my girl? <laughs> okay. I don't think so. So I looked that dog in the face. I said, come down here in Jesus' name. I promise you. It hopped down and was like, I'm looking at her like, we're going to walk this dog now? You want to roll with me? <laughs> and then he bit me immediately. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Imagine. He's just like, I don't know. I'm like, ah, save yourself. <laughs> no, that came much later. You can ask her about the cross country skiing story, she'll tell you all about it. I lacked authority in that moment. Anyways, I digress. The point is, there is an authority in you that everywhere you go, everywhere you walk, everywhere that your body brings you, that you've got to understand that you don't go alone, that you are not walking alone anywhere. In fact, he says it multiple times in Joshua, says it multiple times in the New Testament. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I'll be with you even to the ends of the age. I'm with you, and you want to walk like you've got God with you. I don't know. That's probably how they knew. I don't even know if they knew because of the way they dressed or the way they talked or their accent. I believe they probably knew because they walked in with their shoulders back. Like, I serve the Lord. I'm here on behalf of official business of Jehovah God. And everywhere you go, God's called you to be an atmosphere changer because you bring the atmosphere of heaven with you. Somebody's got to get that today, man. Everywhere you go, I believe there are spiritual alarms that go off. I mean, we read it in Revelation. Remember when we studied out Revelation? All those gnarly creatures came out and started attacking everybody, but they couldn't touch those who what? Had the name of God written on their forehead. There's something that marks your life as a believer that everything in the spirit realm and otherwise, the enemy you cannot see, the enemy you can see, and those who are energized by the enemy that you cannot see, all know and understand the authority that's in you as a child of God. Say, he's threatened threatened. by by me. Amen. Now, in these next... Several verses, we, uh, we see Rahab, the, the prostitute, not getting better morally, but spiraling as she begins to tell lie after lie after lie. <laughs> She's like a really good liar, too, because the intelligence agency of the king was like really tricked by her. She's like, go, you can catch him now. <laughs> go, go, go. It's like... She was a really, really good liar. Uh, But then something magnificent happens. So something beautiful transpires in the life of Rahab. That this morally bankrupt, lying Gentile who had no business even being in the presence of Israelites begins to tell them about their God. How incredible. And she begins by addressing God by his proper name. She doesn't just start telling them about some random God, about some far off man upstairs. She addresses him as Lord, as Yahweh, as Jehovah God. And she says, I know the Lord has given you the land. And in the next several sentences, she all but prophesies the fact that they will conquer Jericho. 
This woman, who seems so just morally bankrupt, now all of a sudden is speaking prophetically and encouraging an entire nation. I I love the fact that she goes to this place because why? It shows she had a level of faith. Track with me, somebody. It, it It was imperfect. And it wasn't like the strongest faith. Hear me. It wasn't a perfect faith. It was an imperfect faith. And it wasn't this super strong faith where she's like, you know, just this incredible, well-rounded Israelite woman. It was this kind of broken faith, but she was on a track. Her faith had her on a track. Hear me, in this track that Rahab was on with her faith, this track would eventually lead to her acting on her faith. It wouldn't always remain where she didn't act on it. Eventually, her faith would lead to action. Eventually, her faith would lead to total surrender to God. Eventually, the track that her faith had her on would get her entire family saved. Her faith and the track that she was on on, hallelujah, mean that her family would get brought into the family of God. We're going to read sometime later where it says that Rahab and her family went with the Israelites and they never departed again. And the track that her faith had her on would eventually lead us to Matthew chapter 1 where I read the lineage of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and I find the name Rahab written in there. I felt so strong. I'll tell you, I I remember as I was studying and praying in my office, I stood up when I wrote this next part, and I just had tears fill my eyes, and all I could do was go, ooh, as I felt the Spirit of God pierce me so strongly for somebody here today, for somebody that hears the sound of my voice when I'm about to tell you that you're here today and you feel like you have an imperfect faith. You feel like you have a broken faith. You feel like you, you're, you've got this love for Jesus, but you feel so unclean in your own right and you feel so broken in your own right but you've got a love for him and I liken it to this your love for Jesus and your life haven't caught up yet your life hasn't caught up for your love for Jesus just yet but you love him you keep falling and you keep failing but you love him all the way you keep messing up and you keep doing things and you go why like Paul but the thing I know to do I don't do it why 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 and but you beat yourself up. And but God, God wants you to know that Paul in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 12 says this. Not that, and this was after more than a decade, almost I think two in ministry, full-time ministry, Paul said this. Not that I've already obtained or am perfect, but I press on. I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. I don't consider that I've made it my own. One thing I do, I forget what lies behind and I strain forward what lies ahead and I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call in Christ Jesus. And the word for you today, if you constantly find yourself feeling like I fail and I'm not there and my life hasn't caught up to my faith yet, is I will press on. I will keep moving forward. I won't quit. I won't give up. I certainly can't go back. Where else am I going to go for the words of eternal life? They're only found in you, Jesus. And Rahab knew that. Rahab decided to press on. Can I hear somebody say, I will press on. Say it again. I will press on. (laughs) Hallelujah. She had caught the fact that God had met her right where she was. He didn't wait for her to stop doing what she was doing to get her language all cleaned up and get her life all cleaned up. He met her right where she was in all of her moral bankruptcy. And she understood that God was about to operate through her in spite of her past and her present that God not only met hear me because some of you you understand that God met you where you were but you might not get that God wants to also operate through you it's great to know he meets you where you're at but guess what that's not where it ends with my Lord and Savior thanks be to God he wants to operate in and through you and the good news is that God didn't need to consult her past God didn't need to consult her present in order to determine her future.
your past, whatever it looks like, your present, whatever it looks like, people might constantly want to consult your past and remind you of it. People might even want to consult your present. Well, you just did that. You just did this. I heard that. Well, guess what? God doesn't need any of that to determine the beautiful future, the limitless future that he has for you because you're learning how to surrender day by day, moment by moment, decision by decision to him. Listen, even in the Israelites, God took some of their ugliest failures, their ugliest failures, and he covered them in mercy. He took some of their ugliest failures, and he covered them in mercy. And I think there was even an instance where one of the nations tried to re-uncover those failures, and like uh, hundreds of thousands of people died because God was like, no, I covered that in mercy. I'm talking about the Ark of the Covenant. It's got three things in it. It's got the rod that budded, it's got the manna, and it's got the Ten Commandments. The rod that budded was when they rejected God's authority. They rejected his authority, his choice of authority, and he said, all right, fine. Let me just tell you what we're going to do because you've rejected me and you've rejected my authority. The manna was a rejection of God's provision. They complained and they whined, manna again? It was a sign of complaining and rejection of God's provision. The Ten Commandments were a pure rejection of His laws. They didn't, the pen was barely, the ink was barely dry. And they're making a golden calf. <laughs> it's like, hello. No other gods, right? Don't make an image, right? <laughs> and so he takes these major failures and he puts them in a box. And the Bible says he covers it with the mercy seat. <laughs> he covers it with the mercy seat. <laughs> you know what? I, I, I may have to retract something. God may consult your past and he may consult your present, but only to let you know it's been covered by the blood of Jesus. <laughs> Hallelujah. Stand with me, church. Stand up, stand up, stand up. Because in the same way that God covered the sin of Israel and the failures of Israel, he wants to cover Rahab's sin and Rahab's past. And so he, just like in Egypt, when he tells them to paint above the doorpost with blood and around the door with blood, he tells her, you tie this scarlet cord you tie this scarlet cord to your window. It's going to be a sign. It's going to mark your home as different from every other home. And that cord still flows today. It flows from the cross of Calvary by way of the blood that was shed, that scarlet blood, that cord that was shed out of the blood of Jesus Christ and into every life that will choose to have him as Lord and Savior. You see, God wants to tie a scarlet cord around our earth. But before God can tie a scarlet cord around the earth, he's got to tie it around the nation. And before God can tie it around the nation, he's got to tie it around the community. And before he can tie it around the community, he wants to tie it to a home. And before he can tie it to a home, he's got to tie it to you. Listen, there's somebody here. God wants you to tie that scarlet cord. He wants you to apply the sacrifice of Jesus Christ to your life. If you say, Pastor, I'm here today and I need to give my life wholeheartedly to Jesus. I need to receive what he's done for me. I want to lift up both hands right now. If that's you, if you say, I need to give my life to Christ right here in this moment. Lift them both up. Don't be shy. This is your moment to say, you know what? I'm giving my life to Christ. I'm giving my life to Jesus. I'm Hey, Pastor Dave here. Just want to say thank you so much for tuning in to our YouTube channel. Uh, make sure if you want to stay up to speed with all the videos that we're going to post in the future, you subscribe to our channel and uh, share it. Get the word out to everybody. Lastly, make sure you go to our website. We have our DNA there, everything the church uh, is about here at Glad Tidings Community Church and all the different ministries that we offer. You can go to www.gtcc.church. Again, thanks for tuning in. God bless you.